Next on Currents News, a new auxiliary bishop is ordained in the Diocese of Rockville Center. I'm Tim Harfman and I'm standing by. Wildfires in Greece are causing death and destruction. Some people flee the flames by jumping into the sea. The latest is next. A Latino pre-shortage. Tonight, an expert joins me to explore the reasons why. And a police officer showing compassion, helping a homeless man in need of a shave. The news starts right now. In Bishop-elect Henning, we have a biblical scholar who knows the smell of the sheep. Bishop John Barris of Rockville Center talking about the man Pope Francis selected to serve the people of Long Island. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Fobles. Auxiliary Bishop Richard Henning was ordained today. He knows the area well, having grown up in Valley Stream, and he's no stranger to the diocese. Currents News Tim Harfman is standing by there. Tim. Liz, he was driving on the Southern State Parkway when the Pope's ambassador to the U.S. called with the news. Today, Bishop Henning is becoming the fourth active auxiliary bishop for the Diocese of Rockville Center. Hundreds of worshipers and clerics gathered for the historic ordination, including Brooklyn Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio and his auxiliaries, the Pope's ambassador to the United States, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, and Cardinal Timothy Dolan. It's a great sign of hope and promise. The church is always growing, right? It's like the Acts of the Apostles. Thanks to the Holy Spirit, the church keeps at it. Archbishop Pierre presented Bishop Henning with his letter from Pope Francis and processed around St. Agnes Cathedral. Rockville Center's diocesan Bishop John Barris describes who Bishop Henning is. In Bishop-elect Henning, we have a biblical scholar who knows the smell of the sheep. He is a u unique combination of faith and reason and a pastoral heart, a pastoral artist. And last week I had the opportunity to sit down with Bishop Henning for an exclusive interview. We discussed his ministry, family life, and even his four-legged best friend. Easy, my friend. Bishop Henning finds peace when he walks Agnes, his eight-year-old lab. But ahead of today's ordination, he was in an emotional whirlwind. There's some fear in there, maybe a little panic, <laughs> um, but uh, also a deep sense of joy. Uh, and probably the strongest emotion is gratitude. The cleric is no stranger to the Long Island Diocese. He grew up in Valley Stream and attended the neighborhood's Catholic schools. He said he was 10 years old when, for the first time, he heard God calling him. After graduating from St. John's University, he went to the Immaculate Conception Seminary in Huntington. The vocation directors always say vocations don't come from the clouds, they come from families. Um, so for me, the, the most powerful influence on me in my faith life itself and my vocation is my family. Bishop Henning was ordained to the priesthood in 1992. He is the oldest of five children. His father was a New York City firefighter and served in the Coast Guard Reserve. His mother started out as a nurse before devoting herself to the family at home. Bishop Henning says he's grateful for the values they instilled in him. You just absorb from your parents sometimes, un, in some sense, unspoken lessons. And one of those lessons was that life is meaningful when you act for others. Now Bishop Henning looks to serve all of the people of the Rockville Center Diocese. He also hopes to team up with the church in Brooklyn. This is one region. So it seems to me inescapable, and, and it would be foolish otherwise than for us to work together um, because we have the same goal, bringing people to uh, a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, but it's also just good strategy. And it is church tradition that a prelate is consecrated by three other bishops. Bishop Henning was ordained by Bishops Barris, retired prelate Will William Murphy, and his now fellow auxiliary bishop, Robert Brennan. In Rockville Center, Tim Harfman, Currents News. Liz, back to you. Oh, Tim, Bishop Henning seems so down to earth. You know, when a priest becomes a bishop, they have a coat of arms and a motto. What did Bishop Henning choose? Yes, during our interview, Bishop Henning told me that he picked a shell. He wanted to keep it simple, so he picked the shell because it reminds him of the Long Island shoreline. And as far as his motto, he, it is put out into the deep, which is from Luke's Gospel, Liz. 
All right, Tim, thank you, thank you very much. Now, the other big story tonight, raging wildfires in Greece have killed dozens of people. The flames spreading so quickly, some people had to jump into the sea to save their lives. As Natasha Chen reports, emergency workers are struggling to contain the blaze. Listen to that wind. That's what's carrying flames and smoke in five major wildfires across Greece. For some residents near the sea, the only way out is to run for the water. While ash turned the sky yellow in Kineta on the western coast, residents captured video in the port town of Rafina on the eastern coast. The woman who took this video said she and her husband headed toward the beach only to be stuck in a gridlock as the black smoke grew closer. She said they could not breathe and panic started everywhere. She said the fire eventually stopped a little more than 100 yards from her house. Those who have been able to visit burned out areas took video of shells of cars and frames where buildings stood. More than 70 people have died, nearly 200 injured while others are still missing. The temperature was so high so nobody could uh, do anything just in this area. As you can see, houses, cars, everything destroyed from the fire. I have lost everything. The Greek prime minister met with firefighters while support poured in from around Europe. The European Commission says they received requests for help and quickly had offers from Spain, Cyprus and Bulgaria. The NATO Secretary General tweeted, NATO stands in solidarity with the Greek people. And through a Kremlin statement, Russian President Vladimir Putin offered condolences and readiness to help. Natasha Chen, Currents News. Also tonight, the clergy sex abuse investigation in Chile is widening. Prosecutors are digging into hundreds of cases. Cases that go back to the year 2000 are being examined. So far, 158 members of the country's Catholic Church, including bishops, priests, and lay workers, have been investigated by the National Prosecutor's Office. Officials have identified 264 victims, most of them children and teenagers. The Nicaraguan Cardinal Leopoldo Brenes held a mass for peace at a parish that came under attack. Paramilitary forces backing the regime of President Daniel Ortega stormed the church and started shooting. The tabernacle is riddled with bullet holes. Ortega ordered a brutal crackdown against the Catholic Church after Nicaragua's population increasingly protested his rule. President Trump is considering stripping a half a dozen people of their national security clearances. The officials used to work for the Obama administration and have publicly criticized Trump. Abby Phillip reports. The White House intensifying their war with the U.S. intelligence community, announcing that President Trump is considering stripping six former national security officials of their security clearances. They've politicized and in some cases monetized their public service and security clearances. These Obama officials have been critical of President Trump's attacks on the intelligence community and the Russia investigation. The idea for revoking clearances was raised by Senator Rand Paul, who met with the president yesterday. I don't think that ex-CIA agents of any stripe who are now talking heads should continue to get classified information. I think it's wrong. Former national security officials routinely maintain their security clearances after they leave office, partly so they can counsel their successors on classified matters. President Trump targeting some of these Obama officials in an interview last week. Do you think any intelligence agencies, U.S. intelligence agencies, are out to get you? Well, certainly in the past, uh, it's been terrible. Uh, you look at Brennan, you look at Clapper, you look at Hayden. Certainly, I can't have any confidence in the past, but I can have a lot of confidence in the present and the future. The White House reiterating that the president has faith in the intelligence community, despite walking back the walk back, again calling the Russia investigation a hoax. The president wants to has purposefully uh, remain uninvolved in this process. However, he sees more and more every single day that this is uh, proving further and further to be a total witch hunt. The president will likely face questions on his new threats to Iran, the summit with Vladimir Putin, and ongoing talks with North Korea. There's evidence Kim Jong-un is holding to his agreement to denuclearize North Korea tonight. Satellite images suggest Pyongyang has started dismantling parts of the facility. This 3D model shows a key missile test site in the north. A nuclear expert called the move an important first step towards fulfilling Kim Jong-un's commitment made during his summit with President Trump. 
Survivors and families of victims killed in the Las Vegas massacre are angry tonight, outraged that they're being sued by the hotel. Stephen Paddock opened fire from the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Resort last October, claiming the lives of 58 people attending an outdoor concert. MGM owns the hotel and went to court looking to shield itself from potential lawsuits. It brings it all up again and takes me right back to being helpless. I am really angry about the MGM. I mean, what gives them the right to do this again? To put us all through that. MGM says it's not asking for money from the survivors and victims' families since the attack. About 2,500 people have sued or threatened to sue MGM. There's a lot more news headed your way. That duck boat tragedy might have been prevented, according to an inspector. An in-depth examination of the Latino pre-shortage. My talk with an expert is next. And the Irish Catholic Church says it's been forced to do something it had opposed. And do you have a story idea? Is something happening in your parish we should know about? We want to hear from you. Keep this email handy. News tips at thesalesmedia.org. We'll be right back. There is a Latino priest shortage that many say is related to culture. Soon, the fifth National Encuentro on Hispanic and Latino ministry will be held in Texas. The Encuentro is designed to energize Hispanic Catholics. Under the leadership of the U.S. bishops, the Encuentro process focuses on meetings, evangelization, and programs that help define how the community responds as a church. The national encounter comes at a crucial time. Recent data shows while U.S. Latinos are a growing population in the church, that fact is not reflected with additional vocations to the priesthood. So what's behind the Latino priest shortage? J.D. Long Garcia is a senior editor for America Magazine. He explored that pressing question with noted experts on Hispanic ministry priests and academics who broke down exactly why young Latino men are steering clear of vocations and JD joins us now thank you so much for being with us JD let's get right to it a key point raised in the article that bears mentioning Latino men who consider the vocation they acknowledge that discernment is not easy however for Latino men it's even more difficult what's the biggest reason why it's a, it's a great question I think that part of the reason is that uh, just uh, just that immigrant culture that you have when you when you come to the United States you you want to make a, a living. You want to you want to uh, make a name for yourself, and uh, and that's not always in a way that, that goes against the culture of vocations. So um, so we have we have in we have in vocations people who are answering the call are uh, are very self giving people. They're um, they're not self centered. They're not materialistic, and um, a lot of times immigrants are coming to, into this country, and um, and that's part of what. The, the confrontation is so we have this culture in the United States mm -hmm. where um, where we constantly want to make money we want to go into jobs that make money and it's not always that kind of uh, self-giving culture uh, JD in keeping with that that line of reasoning culture for the most part is always going to play a part in the lives of Latino men I mean you can't change where you're from but how can these men avoid letting preconceived beliefs like you you have to be married discourage them from vocations Right. As, uh, again, I mean, this might be kind of a, a simple answer, but prayer is always a, one of the big things that comes up when I when I mention, when I talk to vocations directors. Prayer is a huge part of it. Uh, also, it's, it's it's the family. Uh, I spoke with some people, you know, Latinos, and you know, that's a broad brush, of course. Latinos come from all sorts of different countries, and they have very various different cultures that they're coming into play uh, when they're when they're discerning. But um, in general, we have this. Uh, Latinos are very self-giving, and they're very generous people. Uh, so I think that even being in being in touch with the family uh, and staying close to the family and those values is something that would help in the discernment process. JD, how has the sex abuse crisis affected the discernment process among Latino men? Yeah, I think that that's it. It's, it's certainly affected it among Latino men and, and in vocations overall. So. Uh, so what we see in, in the Latino culture, again, according to the people that I've uh, spoken with ab about it, is that uh, it, it, it impacts it as well. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily different in the Latino culture than it is in, in uh, Anglo culture, but uh, it is something that, uh, that makes it difficult to, to make that discernment process. But uh, the, the priest I spoke with, Father Gilbert Guzman, mentioned that it's a, just a very courageous thing for people to come forward uh, and serve in this way. So. 
Um, so they are discerning through it. Uh, JD, we have such a short time left. Education and location playing a major role. In what way? About 30 seconds. In, uh, well, e education, a lot of times what we're finding is that uh, Latinos aren't are graduating from college at, at a lower rate than uh, than others, and so that has an impact because when you enter the call to the priesthood, uh, you, you typically have a college education. And, uh, uh, and the location then, of course, uh, depending on where you are, discerning within a Latino community it makes it a lot more, it's easier when you're surrounded by other, other Catholics. Mm -hmm. J.D., thank you so much. A very comprehensive article in America Magazine. I appreciate your taking the time to talk to us about it. Thank you. Also in the news tonight, hundreds are missing and thousands more are homeless after a dam collapsed in southern Laos. The hydro-powered dam gave way Monday night, causing flash floods across six villages. The collapse released 5 billion cubic meters of water washing away people and their homes. Several deaths have been reported. 6,000 people have been displaced. Record-breaking temperatures in Japan are proving deadly. Temperatures soaring to 106 degrees. At least 77 people are dead, with more than 30,000 hospitalized for heat stroke. Forecasters say the brutal weather could continue until early next month. A startling charge tonight about that duck boat disaster which claimed so many lives. An inspector says warnings about potential problems with the boat were ignored. Andy Rose reports the latest. Ride the Ducks Branson, the company operating the capsized boat that left 17 people dead, is offering to pay for all related medical bills and funeral expenses. They will also assist with any travel or accommodations for family members attending services. The Coast Guard pulled the capsized duck boat from the bottom of Table Rock Lake in Branson, Missouri, Monday. New questions are being raised by an inspector who claims an earlier warning about potential problems with the boat was basically ignored. One of the most uh, prominent things that uh, I found was the exhaust being in the front of the vessel, um, which uh, according to Department of Transportation standards uh, would not pass regulation. Uh, the exhaust has to come out past the passenger compartment. Ripley Entertainment Incorporated, the parent company of the duck boat business, has not responded to the inspector's comments. We're also hearing from another survivor, a 14-year-old girl who says she tried to help though, save too. lives. I went up and I saw someone struggling. I went up to push up their feet so they could get help. But the waves were too big. I couldn't go back to see that person. Lauren lost both her father and brother. Other survivors say no one was wearing a life jacket when the boat went down. State and local authorities are investigating. I'm Andy Rose reporting. One person is dead after a Legionnaire's disease outbreak at a church in Ohio. Eleven cases of the illness have been confirmed in Parma, a Cleveland suburb, all traced to parishioners of St. Columville Parish. Environmental sampling is being conducted at the church and surrounding areas. A Catholic marriage counseling agency in Ireland has agreed not to turn away same-sex couples seeking advice. The agency, which is run by Ireland's Catholic bishops, gave in to the government's demands in order to keep their funding. In Ireland, any group receiving government money must be accessible to everyone, forcing the Catholic agency to offer the help to same-sex couples. Still to come on Currents News, it's a very popular snack, but some of the goldfish are being recalled. We'll tell you which ones. It's huge, a giant iceberg that's threatening a village. The residents speak about their worries. And a cop on the beat helps a homeless man become clean shaven. We'll be right back. Check your pantry if you love to snack on those goldfish. Pepperidge Farm is voluntarily recalling some of its goldfish crackers due to the possibility of salmonella contamination. The four kinds affected are flavor blasted extra cheddar, flavor blasted sour cream and onion, whole grain extra cheddar, and mixed extra cheddar and pretzel. There are no reports so far of anyone getting sick. Residents of a village in western Greenland have a big problem on their hands. An 11 million ton iceberg floating near the coast could collapse at any second. Phil Black met with villagers who say they're very worried. Very few people get to see this, the beautiful hazardous waters of Greenland's west coast. 
a place where icebergs are often vastly larger than any ship trying to avoid them. We've traveled with the Danish Navy to see this one giant mountain of ice. You can see the iceberg's awesome mass above and below the water as it sits right next to the isolated village of Inasuit. At first impression, it looks really big and intimidating, solid and unmoving, wedged tight on the sea floor. But all over the surface, you can see cracks and crevices, weak points that have the potential to split. And if they do, suddenly you can see the dramatic breakup of this iceberg would be a hugely violent event. We go ashore in the twilight gloom that is a summer's night here. From almost every angle, the iceberg looms over this community. It's beautiful. Beautiful? Yes. Why is it beautiful? We are used to it. We have many uh, like this in summers. And, uh, but it seems, it seems bigger than the, than the others. Bigger, and most dangerously, it's closer. If the iceberg breaks or rolls, it would send tsunami-like waves toward these people. Hans Matthias Christensen has lived in Inasuit for 52 years. Like almost every man here, he fishes, hunts seals and whales, even polar bears in winter, and he knows icebergs. He tells me his father taught him grounded icebergs are the most dangerous because they eventually break. He's seen them destroy boats, and he knows there will be huge waves from this one. The people here felt some relief when the iceberg moved a little just beyond their harbour, and they hope higher sea levels with the next full moon will allow it to lift off the bottom and float away. But if it doesn't, it will eventually become unstable, like this, another massive iceberg we could see from Inasuit. We've sped up the video to show the incredible power as it rolls in the water. Scientists say the glaciers in this specific region of Greenland have long been known for producing big icebergs. There's no known link to climate change. The people of Inasuit know how to endure the challenges of living in the Arctic. One key rule, hard learned by generations, they must keep their distance from the unpredictable frozen giants they share these waters with. Phil Black, Inasuit, Greenland. My goodness, we certainly wish them well. Protect and serve. And when you can, offer a quick shave. Tallahassee police officer Tony Carlson went above and beyond for a homeless man trying to clean up his appearance for a job interview. Problem is, his secondhand razor was broken, so Officer Carlson repaired it. Now, when he noticed that the man could not quite manage on his own, he shaved his beard for him. He was excited, you know, that... Uh there was a chance that he was going to get a job if he just did this simple thing of trying to clean up something. Um, I wish I could have done more, you know, but in between calls for service, uh, this was the best I could do. It was the nicest thing he could do. One passerby videotaped the act of kindness, which quickly went viral, of course. The freshly shaved man says he hopes his clean cut look will get him hired at a nearby McDonald's. Best story ever. We wish him the best of luck. That is Currents News. Thank you for joining us. I'm Liz Fobless. Set your DVR to record this program so that you never miss it because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.